Today, we're going to be discussing the use of technology and data to help in the national efforts against COVID-19. So it will have been hard to miss the conversations taking place both in the news and on social media around um, public health interventions in response to COVID-19, um, such as contact tracing, proximity tracking, and of course the lockdown itself that we all found ourselves under. So today we have an experienced panel of experts with us to help us grapple with the necessity of and the privacy and ethical considerations attached uh, to such interventions. So um, I'll just go through and quickly introduce the panel. So we have uh, Lord Jonathan Evans, who is chair of the Committee on Standards in Public Life and was uh, Director General of the British Security Service, MI5, from 2007 to 2013. We have Imam Hock, who is CPO and co-founder of Quantexa, a contextual big data analysis software company. We have Dr. Rosaria Tadeo, who is Senior Research Fellow and Deputy Director at the Digital Ethics Lab, which is based at the Oxford Internet Institute and Turing Fellow uh, here at the Alan Turing Institute. And finally, we have Professor Jonathan Crowcroft, who is Marconi Professor at the University of Cambridge and researcher at large here at the Turing. Unfortunately, Simon Eccles could not join us today and he sends on his apologies. Um, so a big thank you uh, to the panel for your time today. So let's start off with um, some questions to introduce the panel. Um, so firstly, if I could turn to you, Jonathan Evans. Um, you wrote an article recently for the Sunday Times entitled The Use of Surveillance Techniques to Beat Coronavirus Requires Public Trust. Could you briefly walk us through your key messages in that article? Yeah, I was very struck when, you, when the initial response to COVID was being put together internationally that both in some environments, particularly in Israel and one or two other countries in, in the Far East, the security services of those countries were actually being used as uh, experts on how to use surveillance capabilities in a public health context. Uh, and at the same time, there was discussion going on in the UK about the, uh, the test and track model and the app that was in design. And it seemed to me that there were quite interesting parallels between the issues that we faced as a country after 9-11 with a major threat to public well-being some of the options for countering of which it were the use of data and particularly surveillance style data and the experience of the intelligence community and the police was that unless you establish that at an early stage with a proper statutory basis with public consent then you may well find that public trust can be undermined uh, in the longer term and i thought that was the 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 important message to get out at that point in the debate Fantastic. Thank you, uh, Jonathan. Um, Imam, you have a strong experience in bringing together disparate data sets and, um, and in enriching data with external sources. Um, how do you think these techniques could be used to help us counter COVID-19? Yeah, it's interesting because if you think about the data that government actually has access to today, there's the electoral register, there's HMRC has all the employees of all companies, you would have schools, pupils, you could have hospitals and hospital employees and people who go to hospitals. Uh, and you can infer an awful lot from that data who might travel from their home to a location where they work, uh, whose children go to what schools, who may be in which hospital. So when you join all that together, it becomes like a large sort of interconnected network of relationships. And on top of that, typically what people do is they build models. So we're familiar and used to building models for things like tax evasion, uh, insurance fraud, which was something done at a UK scale, anti-money laundering. Obviously, you know, some of the banks we work with, we see HSBC, it's mentioned here as a sponsor. Uh, we process 50 billion records there, every single transaction. So it is normal practice to do this for a set of given reasons. Um, for COVID, that information that I just described could actually give you, without getting down to the granularity of using mobile tracking devices, but at least en masse at company by company, school by school, hospital by hospital, town by town, you know, nursery by nursery, um, elderly home by elderly home or care home, you could see a big picture and you could lay over on top of that instances where people have tested positive or not. You could infer the different R numbers. You know, a nursery might have an R number of X, whereas a office business might be Y and a building site might be Z. But all that data is actually available without getting into the complexities of tracking. In the past, it's been a question for the ICO, the information commissioner, as to is it worth that 
bringing that much data together to tackle a problem? Is it proportional? Um, and what will people think about it? And people often give their data up, particularly if it, there's a benefit to them, particularly in the commercial world. You think about every time you're shopping and you've got a club card of some description, you're sharing a lot of data. So I think there's an awful lot that can be done here. Um, and it's not beyond technology, it's more a question of the legal gateways and the public interest and the public consent effectively and trust around that. Um, fantastic. Thank you, uh, Imam. Um, now, John Crowcroft, um, you have a, a large amount of experience in the area of contact tracing and expertise in the, the privacy and, and the effectiveness of such systems. Um, could you provide us with an overview of your previous work and, and how this has been informing the current crisis? Uh, yeah, do you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you okay. Great. Um, so the, uh, uh, we worked on this uh, starting 12, uh, 13 years ago. We were interested in whether people's real world uh, social lives were reflected in their online social lives. So we decided to directly measure the encounters between people by using uh, a Bluetooth uh, sensing between phones. And we built a thing called FluPhone, which actually tracked this. In the process of um, messing around with this, we were contacted by uh, the um, uh, London School of Tropical Medicine Hygiene uh, and Health Protection Agency UK, which is sort of public health people, because there was an H1N1 epidemic and they were interested in understanding uh, uh, what was actually happening at a detailed level. So what we just heard about from um, Imam was a really great description of sort of uh, uh, this uh, aggregate level of understanding you can get, and quite fine grain, but we were really drilling down to the individual contacts, and that gives you some really interesting things. If you know more things about the individuals, for example, do uh, young people with low symptomatic uh, you know, behavior, they exhibit very few symptoms in fact elderly and we in, in, in more than uh, each other or uh, or not we just don't know that and if you can measure the specific encounters and then look at whether somebody was infected and somebody else is allegedly susceptible you know then well, what you see is important um, all kinds of other things can can be found out but particularly you can also follow up that when somebody has been tested you can go back through their contacts which may be recorded in some way uh, perhaps in a decentralized or a centralized way um, in our case we recorded them in a centralized way, uh, went through medical ethics, we had approval, we had explicitly listed who was going to be looking at the data, why, and that the data would all be deleted at the end of each period. Uh, that was all clear in our protocol, um, uh, which the uh, NHS X people could have read. <laughs> it wasn't a secret. Um, there's a direct link between their app and what we did. In fact, John Edmonds, who is on SAGE, was one of our participants in our project 12 years back. So there's you know, knowledge of what we were doing. Um, uh, but then you can then trace contacts. So this is super interesting because then obviously, if you can do that electronically, you can accelerate the process which you break the chains of infection. And that's very important, particularly with COVID-19. When we were looking at this, the parameters of the epidemic, which was H1N1, was such that actually uh, it turned out not to be so important and the, the vulnerable groups, that in fact, were young, surprisingly, the elderly were not vulnerable. Um, in our case, now we have something where um, the day somebody exhibits symptoms is the, the very high infectiousness. If you can catch all their contact within a day, you it very much lower the, the knock-on effect, the, the, the R0, if you like. You can reduce the effective R0 a very large amount. Um, this kind of assumes that a lot of people are running these apps that use Bluetooth to detect contacts. Uh, that assumes uh, that uh, you know some high fraction of people that have, uh, say, smartphones today would download and run the app um, and allow their data to go into some system uh, and understand what that meant. And of course, there's a, a fraction of people that have no such phones so on the order of 20%, and another fraction of the 80% that have such phones don't like the idea anyway same kind of people that don't give up all their data to Facebook, but um, probably don't even like uh, uh, Boots uh, um, and Tesco's club card type activities, but who knows? Um, uh, and we have actually done a survey of, of British attitudes, and of course, uh, the attitude to the NHS itself in terms of trust is, is very high, um, although that, that could be undermined, but uh, uh, there's a you know, fairly strong belief that the right things will be done with the data in support of both the understanding of where there are hotspots where, and so on, and the understanding of what you could do in, in terms of accelerating contact tracing above and beyond what you do manually with the newly recruited large numbers of people uh, to do that. So, so bringing that down from three, four days down to well below one day would certainly reduce the knock-on infections a lot and potentially allow you to stay in the kind of safer operating regime of the, of the pandemic or, or, or you know, sub uh, 
uh, way stuff might even keep it down to very very close to zero cases yeah. if you were super fast which would be very good so so that's what what we were, were building and i think that's kind of the origin of the way the nhs x app and, uh, was designed and why it operates in that way there's also uh, some links with how fast testing works which uh, uh, which kind of matter um, that how quickly you get your results from testing as an important parameter which maybe we'll, we'll come back to later because the sure. uh, current latency in the national system is, is, is highly variable and not great yeah okay no that's brilliant thank you uh, thank you john um just to quickly mention we've just had, we just had some technical issues with our closed captioning but it's up and running now um so thank you and finally rosaria um you've recently co-authored an article entitled um ethical guidelines for COVID-19 tracing apps. Could you briefly walk us through these guidelines? Yes, um, so the, the, the article um, starts with considering the um, trade-offs that might be required to use this kind of um, applications, whether it's tracing or tracking. So there is a lot of debate whether um, tracing um, using mobile phones data encroaches too much on individuals' privacy and whether that's correct or not, that's fair or not. So the article starts considering how uh, privacy is, is a fundamental right, but it's not an absolute right. You, you can have like trade-off in privacy. The point is that the trade-off needs to be justified, to be acceptable, uh, ethically justified. Um, and in the article, we refer to existing international documents um, and regulation, even the GDPR, to say that the justification of the um, right to privacy stays uh, or rests on four principles. Uh, necessity, whether privacy is being breached because the solution that we are considering is the one that is actually uh, necessary to bring us forward, uh, whether it's proportion. So we're giving away a little bit of privacy, but in return, we are gaining, for example, um, we're fostering our right um, to health. Uh, and whether there are scientific evidence to support the uh, efficacy of these moves, uh, and whether these solutions which are breaching our privacy are going to be temporary. So they're not going to be uh, without the sunset close. Uh, on the basics of these four principles, we, we, we develop a set of guidelines which have the goal of answering two questions. Are we developing the right app? And are we developing this app in the right uh, ways? And of course, there are, these are not a uh, binary answer. There is more of a like of a modularity. They define thresholds which can then be more or less acceptable depending on the cultural, the legal, the situational context in which we are. The key point I want to stress um, of this analysis is, is that there is a triangulation between protecting privacy uh, to ensure that the app will actually foster privacy, but also equality and fairness, trust, fostering trust, and actually the efficacy of these methods. If privacy or rights are breached too much, if we cannot protect privacy, equality and fairness, well, we lose trust in public institutions. And that loss of trust can be actually quite permanent or lasting in the, in the long term. And this can impact the uptake of the app and the efficacy of the app. We've seen this already in Australia or in Singapore, for example. So it's this triangulation which shows us the need to consider why, how we are breaching privacy, um, but also the other four principles and how we can make sure that we do this in the right, uh, in the right way. Fantastic. Um, thank you, Rosaria. And we'll, we'll definitely come on to expand upon some of those points um, as well. Um, so to start off with, um, and this was quite a nice segue, uh, let's talk about the effectiveness or the efficacy of digital tracking and tracing. So um, as most people will be aware, the idea of uh, digital proximity tracking is that you can use people's mobile devices to track, um, which they carry with them all the time, to track when two people may have been in close physical proximity. And combined with hygiene and social distancing measures, um, contact tracing, including both the, the manual and the digital aspect, presents a, a potentially powerful way to, to help break uh, transmission chains and, and lower the reproduction rate or the R of the virus. Um, however, digital proximity is only a proxy for, for a real life interaction. It's a model. Um, and we know that the, the world doesn't model particularly easily. So um, if I could come back to you, John Crowcroft, um, why is digital proximity tracking necessary? And how good a proxy is it for actual risk of infection? Well, we don't actually know the answer to that. But one of the things that the trial of the NHSX app is doing is trying to measure that. Uh, the, the problem is that the transmission of the viruses you know, goes through multiple vectors. So somebody can cough right in front of you or on you. They can touch the surface and you touch the surface shortly after. They can cough on some material that you, you, know, you touch and so on. So uh, we don't know the relative risks of those. We don't know how long the virus survives in 
the way that can infect you. You know, and in a lab, what happens if somebody puts a virus in a, you know, an aerosol spray and puts it on the surface? That doesn't tell you about the receiver process. What we do know, though, is that uh, if you're within a couple of meters of somebody for more than 15 minutes, that that's a, a pretty good proxy for an opportunity of infection. Uh, and if you're, you know, within five meters of somebody for 15 seconds that's a good chance you're not infected um, but these are all statistical um, you know processes so one of the things that the nhsx trial is doing is actually calibrating these to try and improve the the precision of what uh, the the number of bluetooth exchanges and signal strength which gives you a, a, a very approximate uh, measure of, of, of closeness over a number of readings, it can give you a kind of an idea. And then turning that into a kind of risk factor, but you then couple that with the infectiousness of the person who's reported or been tested positive to work out what radius would be a high risk and what beyond what radius would be, would be almost zero risk. It's not gonna be perfect, uh, but of course, nothing's perfect. Your vaccines aren't perfect, treatments sure. aren't perfect. It's about reducing the statistics uh, at some level. and. Um, uh, so yeah, trying to turn these things into good proxies is, is an empirical thing. It's not a theoretical thing you can do in, you know, on a piece of paper uh, with some clever maths people. Um, uh, the, 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 the model of, uh, uh, of infection is you know, it's multimodal uh, and it's, it's complex and nobody uh, believes the, the lab results for those infection vectors translate into what happens in the physical world. If you look at, for example, some ratios of what I was looking at recently, um, the chance of getting infected outdoors are around 3,000 times lower than indoors. Uh, the chance of getting infected in your household or worker are uh, about uh, 16 times higher than getting infected in other places. So these are, like, these are very big jumps. And so there's something funny going on about the way infectiousness works that's, that's you know, not understood. And I'm not an immunologist, virologist, or epidemiologist. I'm a computing person that builds systems to, to, uh, to listen to what the epidemiologists have feed us and then study, you know, when you build them and put them out and deploy them, how you can tune them to work well. And that's what uh, uh, the folks I know uh, in the NHSX world are doing as well, which I think is, is jolly good. And, and many of the other app developers have had to do. It's not, we're not the only app in town, in fact. There are hundreds of apps out there um, across the world, uh, several of which are very, are, are pretty sophisticated in this area. Um, if you want a sort of bottom line, I mean, we know that the total improvement of reduction in R zero possible with paper by uh, uh, Kuchowski and, and Hannah Fry and others is just probably on the order of 15, 20%. So it's a contribution, but it's definitely not a silver bullet. But you know, if you do really well, you get a large fraction of people running the apps and you tune the app really well and it's a good proxy and you use it to contact trace fast. If all those things line up the right way, you get that improvement that could be a very important improvement right it's not yeah, like a absolutely yeah yeah uh, yeah um if i could just bring you in uh, rosaria um so it, it sounds like there's a lot of unknowns here um and there's a real chance that such a system in the real world may or, or may not prove practical um if, if the accuracy is too low and too many false positives are generated um this would either result in healthy people being quarantined for no good reason or um, conversely being sent to medical facilities where the risk of infection may actually be much higher. Um, how, how do you measure the, the performance of, of these systems and how do you mitigate these in a sort of ethical manner? Yeah, so you're correct. The risks are uh, all the one that you mentioned. There is also a sense of a risk to enabling a false sense of security. People might feel they're safe because the app is not flagging up um, anyone. Uh, or might be infected in the previous day, but if an app, for example, is not based on um, medical or official testing, it's hard to understand whether you really actually encountered or did not encounter people who had the disease, um, and, and so on and so forth. There are risks, risks that you were um, uh, referring to before um, in terms of whether Bluetooth can be accurate enough. You know, it's, it's Bluetooth models distance, not proximity. So if I'm close to someone behind the wall, that still counts uh, for the Bluetooth uh, analysis, not uh, actually for what, the inform for, it does not provide the information we're looking for. I think that the solution there is a solution that from my point of view and my perspective, so it's not the engineering one, but the policy, let's say, or, or the guidance ones, is the continuing monitoring of the app, the continuing monitor monitoring of the results, of the way it is um, used, whether it is used, what are the, um, the consequences that we see. We need a, a way of monitoring um, the result or the use of this thing, and we need accountability. Uh, we need someone who's responsible for collecting data, assess whether these data are going into the right direction, 
and then make decision whether continue, whether change, whether stop the app. Uh, uh, there has to be this kind of assessment and monitoring, which is a constant. Uh, let's not forget that the pandemic is a fast changing context. We don't know very well the biology of the virology of the virus, and we don't know what we don't know in terms of how the situation can develop. And digital technologies play a key role in this contest because they can help us, as John was telling us before, but they also very much, their uptake, the way they impact on society is very much cultural, culturally dependent. So we're adding an extra variable in a contest which is already very complex. It's not possible, it's not fair as well, or correct, to inject this new technology into society and forget about it and let it run uh, um, as if it was, uh, as if it was um, uh, perfect. And let's not forget one thing, that this whole business, this whole introducing an app, encroaching on people's privacy, ask people to sacrifice some of their right, is only justified if the app works. If the app doesn't work, there's no need to have it there. So making sure that the app works, monitoring whether it's working, and being able to intervene when it, when it doesn't, is a key ethical aspect to keep in mind, and it's a key ethical responsibility of public institutions. Yeah, fantastic. Um... So, okay, let, let's move on to, um, to trust and oversight. Um, so evidently for such an intervention to be most effective, um, both consent and trust are required from the public. Um, so Jonathan Evans, if I could turn to you. Um, so you have a, a vast experience in working at that intersection uh, between privacy and security um, and in the importance of legislation and the authorization of, of intrusive powers. Um, and if I could just very briefly quote your, your recent article uh, in the Sunday Times, you said, uh, tough surveillance powers are acceptable where there are equally tough oversight and accountability that ensures the powers are applied lawfully, proportionately, and only where necessary. Um, off the back of this, do you believe that dedicated legislation is necessary to authorize such a novel and unprecedented public health intervention? I think if we're talking about the NHSX app, then I don't think that's required. Um, decisions have been already taken to go down a relatively modest path in terms of uh, intrusion into privacy, in my view, particularly the fact that this is voluntary. Uh, you could envisage, uh, and in some countries we have had, uh, systems which are not as voluntary, where they can be imposed centrally without your volunteering and downloading an app. You don't need to download an app in order to monitor the location of somebody's smartphone, etc., self-evidently. Um, so we're already in a situation which I applaud that the NHS and government have decided to go for a relatively unintrusive model as to how to do this. And I don't think you need separate uh, uh, legislation for that as far as I can see. Um, I think I would also call out the fact that the, the NHS X have been quite open about the way they've been doing this, which I think is critical. They've been uh, clear about what they're trying to do, how they are doing it. Uh, the source code has been published. They've got an external panel of, uh, for ethical review. So I think all those things are encouraging as far as um, public consent and public confidence are concerned. Um, I think the accountability issue, I would be encouraged if there were a clearer uh, external accountability for whether this is working, how the trade-offs are being made not suggesting that they're not being made in a, in a proportionate way, but this would, at the moment, this looks like it's kind of checking your own homework by NHSX and by government, and it would be reassuring, I think, for the public if there were in some form of external, uh, independent scrutiny of all this in order to say, assuming that it is accurate, yes, this is fair. And I think that is something that at the moment we don't have, uh, and potentially something in terms of a redress mechanism for those who feel that this hasn't worked right for them, although that's much less needed, I think, where you have a voluntary download arrangement rather than a centralised uh, top-down surveillance model, which we have not opted for. Yes, fantastic. Um, so if, if I could turn to, to Imam now. Um, so there are, there are obviously parallels here to other areas in, in finance and in um, sort of, uh, security and, and defence. Um, what are your thoughts on um, the sort of accountability bit? Yeah, so the first thing I guess you've got to realise is when you're dealing with risk, it's a multi-layer response. It isn't a single silver bullet system that will solve everything. So that makes the whole landscape far more complicated because you're not just looking at this one system 
is that accountable this one approach uh, and by a multiple response what we need to do is get the public engaged as well as uh, the people who are doing the operations and it's parallel to many things that go on uh, in the world of you know detecting things like anti-money laundering working out whether you're good for credit uh, and all of these things and it's in the best interest of the public and that's the fundamental here uh, with insurance claims fraud the insurance fraud bureau carried everybody's data because it was going to cost the public a lot more than insurance policies and everyone saw it and it was agreed it was a good thing and the trust was there because it was the association of british insurers clearly if the government is running it it becomes harder and you need more accountability there and really what you what you're trying to do here is set up a system of controls where ultimately you want to identify more of the risk with fewer of the false positives because it actually impinges upon people's life and reduce the time and effort for all these people doing track and trace and they're the same three variables that make any system effective whether you're trying to do tax collection and tax compliance uh, insurance claims fraud money law it doesn't really matter but um, these things are all statistics as john was saying it's all a game of statistics every little nudge you can do to make the statistic a little bit better and it's multiple nudges will improve the situation for everyone and you know even tax authorities with their draconian or historically draconian approach to collecting taxes have realized you've really got to get the public on side and give them the nudges and get them on board with it and it makes a much bigger difference than armies of people trying to impose something upon people um rosario if i could bring you in here um so you, in your recent paper, as, as you uh, outlined earlier, um, you, you mentioned these four high-level design principles, which were um, necessity, proportionality, scientific soundness, and uh, time-boundedness. And on, on that latter one, time-boundedness, uh, time boundedness, is this something that we should expect to, to see um, attached to, to the use of such an app? Indeed, uh, that, that, that's crucial. Um, the app is only justified because we need to mitigate the crisis. It loses its uh, justification when the crisis is over. So uh, there has to be a sunset close uh, somewhere at some point. It has to be explicit. There is to be a, a, a clear uh, information about when the app might be um, disclosed. Uh, disclosed. Uh, of course, this has, is something that has to be defined following the scientific advice. So we might assess by the you know, government sets a date and then in six months, uh, we need a few more extra months or we might be able to do that earlier. But some kind of indication has to be um, uh, has to be uh, provided uh, in uh, in this sense. Um, and in the same way, um, the, the, it goes back to the point of being able to monitor the impact of the app uh, on uh, on society and understanding, for example, what are the final what are the conditions to remove this, this app from societies as well, but also what we're going to do after it. So what we're going to do with the data once we have collected them? Are these data going to be uh, deleted, disclosed, disclosed, or disposed? Who's going to have access to this? Is it going to be just scientists, or are we going to allow third parties to access this data? These are very sensitive data, and irrespective of whether they are identifiable data or not, whether they are anonymized, anonymized or anonymized data they pose serious risks for individual and group privacy because they tell us about our relation to a condition who will impact our health uh, status in the medium and in the long uh, term. Suppose we find out that uh, in five years, people who have been affected by coronavirus are going to develop serious health or I don't know, mental health, breathing, whatever health conditions. How do we make sure that we protect that category of people, irrespective of their uh, identification? against possible discrimination, unfair treatment, and so on and so forth. So it's not just about identifying a date when the app will be uh, off, uh, let's say, our mobile phone. It's also identifying what will happen to the whole infrastructure we have built to support the app once, once the app will not be necessary anymore. And this is a key point with respect to the protection of individual um, rights, uh, something that I would like to see discussed a bit more, uh, to be fair. Sure. Um, so, so we'll come on um, shortly to, term, to, to talk about the, the voluntary nature of, of the app. Um, but um, if I could just ask John uh, Crowcroft uh, his, his thoughts on, on the, the time boundedness and the, the sunset clause. Uh, yeah, I'm a little bit alarmed at, actually at the manual contact tracing. Um, uh, NHS has declared how long they're keeping the data there of your contacts. So keeping your personal data as part of your health record 
that you've been infected and recovered is clearly useful if there are long-term uh, implications. But the, the manual data is for your contacts, which includes the names and addresses of people, have been kept for five years. I cannot see any epidemiological uh, reason for doing that. And then with the, um, with the app, um, where, which is to accelerate contact tracing, but then it feeds into the same requirement for epidemiology, uh, the contact tracing requirement is, you know, five days. I mean, if you don't get people in five days, the manual people have beaten you anyway, so that's completely silly. Um, but let's say 30 days. Um, the epidemiological need for this data is clear, but it's statistical, and you analyze the data for, for figuring out the SEIR parameters, and you improve them, and you improve matching them to compartments in your population, your know, age groups, or relative age groups of, the, of susceptible infectious and exposed, and so on. And all these things are understood, but that could be done in one pass, uh, again, you know, within a month. Um, and so there's, there's no good reason for this. And in fact, I'm, I'm actually alarmed from, from the ethical perspective because uh, the implication is an open-ended requirement to, oh, I just didn't think of this before. That is completely against medical ethics. That is not a thing you do. You say what the data is for, you know, from the get-go, and that is what you use it for, and then you don't need the data anymore. Um, and we have very clear needs for the data on an urgent basis. That, that's fine. And most people are persuaded of that. Some people not but you know that's okay and we've had that discussion and then we, and we have these two uses but but the open end you know somebody somebody suddenly goes oh we could do a use of time I'm, I'm worried by that and you know i don't see any good basis for not having a statement that this is to update the epidemiological models once we've done that we've already done all the contact tracing all that data can go and the problem is that you when you give your contacts whether manually or from the app you're giving data about other people this is a very, very specific step. Now, the last thing is the data is a graph structure. When you put all the contact tracing together, you have a social network. You can't anonymize that. Anyone who thinks you can anonymize that has no idea about anonymization. So you can't release that to any third party. No, that's just not a thing. Um, you know, I can tell you people at Bell Labs who tried to work on anonymizing cool data records and, and gave up. You know, it just is so, you know, so this is incorrect. That, that, that people say, well, we might share it with some epidemiologists to come up with another thing, you know, which would be, you could come up, you could think that, that for example, the fact that BAME, you know, black ethnic uh, groups are slightly more susceptible, well, maybe we discover something about DNA. Yeah, we'll discover that, but don't use the social graph to do it. That's just not a thing. So I, I'm, um, I'm very, I, I, I'm totally uh, with, you know, with the other commentators on this, this time bound in this, and the proportionality has just not been uh, respected properly, in my view. Sure. Thank you. Um, thank you, John. Um, okay, let's let's move on to talk a bit about the um, the societal impacts of of such an app. Um, so, so the app itself is is um, is voluntary, um, not mandatory. Um, and uh, well, in in reality, there things aren't really that simple. So there is a spectrum between voluntary and mandatory. Um, and I'm sure it won't be long before we'll see some form of unofficial compulsion or strong encouragement, at the very least in different areas of society. Um, for example, uh, the ability to enter a premises such as a shop or a pharmacy. Um, if I could come to uh, Jonathan Evans, um, how, how do you counter this potential, um, this potential difficulty? I think you, the, the first thing you need to do is actually to establish overall trust in the integrity of the process. This is why I think things such as redress and accountability are, and independent accountability are so important, uh, because it's one thing to ask the government, uh, the public to trust the government, but uh, you'll probably have even more success if they can trust somebody else to make sure that the government are doing what they say. And that I think is a very important part of this. Um, I think there also need to be guidelines, because as you say, there is a risk that this will become de facto compulsory. And if that, does happen, I think that will have a long-term negative impact on willingness of the public to cooperate with the system. So I don't think you can take this particular piece of the, uh, the, the, the whole sort of strategy of countering the disease and see it on its own. It only makes sense in terms of the totality. So you've got to think about trust all the way through uh, in terms of the way in which what is said, how it is communicated, who communicates it, what degree of independent check and, uh, and scrutiny there is, all of those have got to be in place. And then this has a better chance of working uh, in this particular part. And I think you know, John Crocroft made a very important point, which is you know, this particular aspect is one 
useful contributor to countering a disease. It is not the answer. Uh, and so we need to do everything else as well. And if we just treat this on its own, I think we're much less likely to get the outcome that we need. Um, yes, so, so Rosaria, um, if I could just bring you in here. Um, so I suppose this risk that, um, that Jonathan talks about is potentially greater if we consider the introduction of so-called immunity certificates. So that is a, a official documents that uh, are registered by some health authority that state whether or not an individual has had uh, coronavirus, for example. Now, putting aside for a second the fact that it's not clear the extent to which immunity to coronavirus actually exists at the moment, um, are immunity certificates an effective and, I suppose, maybe more importantly, an ethical way to counter the virus? I think that the key point there is attaching the immunity certificate to digital technologies, to the app specifically. We, we have ways of certificate whether you, we, you have been vaccinated against the disease or whether you've taken the right um, you know, preventive measures before going in certain places. The point is to link that to a digital device and to link the two things, the certificate to the digital device to access key services in society. This is where the ethical problems emerge. And this is where the trust gap breached, uh, broke, uh, broken, sorry, because it shows that public institutions are not doing the, the right thing. They are not behaving fairly with respect to the old population. The issue is that in the UK, for example, we have 20% who don't use smartphones. Some of the apps, the apps that the, the, the NHS is planning might not be able to work on some versions of Android and um, Apple phones. That means that there is a chunk of the population, 20%, who might not be able to access the tube, the train, the airport, the office, because they don't have the right to access to the right technology. It's a way of cutting out a big portion of the population. How do we address that? So this is the question that we have to face. It's not so much whether we want to have immunity passports, whether we can attach immunity passport to a specific access and ability to use a certain technology. Let's not forget that the app in itself requires being able to um, uh, install the app, uh, being connected with um, 3G or Wi-Fi, that requires some level of digital literacy, which are not, uh, unfortunately, uh, as much as the UK is an information society, mapping one-to-one -to, -one to the old population. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how do we make sure that we can support access to key services, healthcare, education, work, transport, you name it, independently of whether we have access to digital technologies? And if we realize that we, can, if, that we cannot do it independently, then how we ins expand the scope of people who can now access to these uh, technologies and know how to use it? That's the problem. Mm -hmm. And the other problem is that you, you're right in saying that um, voluntary uh, has quite of a, a range of possible implementations. Um, to, be, to be purely voluntarily, the app has not to be attached to any form of reward, whether it's endogenous or exogenous, because at that point, it stops being voluntarily. If I need the app to go to work, well, that's not voluntarily anymore. And so the data I'm, sees I'm, 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 I'm giving away, they are not given away on a voluntarily basis. And so this is a very important fundamental question. Trust is not breached because there is no accountability. Trust is breached even before that, when public institutions show to try to can, so to, so to speak, um, individuals and citizens, when they not, don't behave in a just, fair way. And this is one way of doing that, for example. So this is very important to keep in, uh, uh, in mind uh, in, this, in this respect. And the other um, aspect I wanted to touch upon, just to um, agree with John, um, John Crawford. The risk here is that we enable, through digital technologies, the definition of a very specific social graph, the ability to run a very in-depth surveillance um, uh, on citizens, which might be out of proportion without having the necessary benefits. So it's important that we navigate this path uh, to harness the potential of the app, which is exactly the one of you know, helping us mitigating the pandemic. But also we do this in, in a fair, right proportionate way, uh, which I'm afraid to some extent are not, uh, all the conditions are not really met um, at this point. Sure, thank you. Um, let's, let's move on at this point to um, our final uh, topic of discussion today, which is on the uh, ongoing debate on centralized versus decentralized implementations.
So um, broadly, there are, there are two ways of implementing a, a digital contact tracing system, centralized and decentralized. Um, in, in a centralized system, generally the interactions between people are calculated in some central uh, location um, and in an anonymized or, or pseudonymized way. Um, in a decentralized system, uh, these interactions are calculated on an, an individual's device. Um, there's two very different trust models here, which both have their, their pros and cons. Um, first, before we talk about um, the, the approach that um, NHSX have gone for, um, Imam, if I could bring you in here, we, we tend to see a difference between the trust people have in um, tech companies um, and their willingness to pass over data um, and the government when, when it comes to the processing of such data. Um, why, why do you think this difference exists? And is there anything that the, you know, the, the government approach can do at this point to really leverage that, that difference? Um, I think it's an interesting question. And, it, and even before technology companies, there was always the question of trust between a commercial organization versus government. We trust the telephone companies to know every single call we make and who we make it to. We don't trust all that data to be handed over en masse to government. And that really comes down to people's fears about what government may choose to do with it beyond its initial claimed use case. Um, the technology company question is an interesting one. Um, they all sort of started out as being the sort of new uh, interesting organizations, not too authoritarian and this, that and the other. But actually now you start seeing cracks occurring where people are concerned about you know what exactly is Facebook doing people are concerned about some technology companies that have reputations within certain very highly secure environments and those sorts of things so I think that the question of trust uh, transparency and behavior are critical if you come to the sort of take up of the device it's of course very easy to switch the device off for a period of time right because you want to do something and you're not sure that you want people to know what you're doing or whatever it may be. And if you lose that trust and transparency, then the behaviors are wrong and then you lose the public as well. And then the system becomes almost worse because everyone's avoiding using it at the time when they're making most contact, for instance. Um, so, you know, I'm going to a rave. It's maybe not a rave that everyone thought I'd be going and I don't want anyone to know, switch it off. Um, and then you're misled. So, I mean, you see that time and a time again with people's behavior. You know, if, if people think everyone else is getting away with something, they'll want to do it. You know, I'll drop bleach on my carpet every three years because I've not made an insurance claim and I've paid my insurance and everyone else is making claims. It's a classic example of behavior. So I think everything has to be open. Trust has to be there throughout the process. Um, and I think when, it, when it's government, it has to be a little bit extra. It's not just the same as if it's a commercial organization because they don't have the powers of the police and the powers you know of, uh, of, of those things that we've seen in the past you know like Guantanamo Bay or whatever it might be. Sure fantastic thank you. Um, so John Crowcroft if I could come to you now so the, the NHSX app as, as we'll, uh, we'll know has, has gone for the, uh, the centralized approach um, could could you walk us through the the pros and cons of this model? What what can you do with a with a centralized approach from an epidemiological perspective that you can't in a in a decentralized system? Uh, so the principal things you could do potentially are more easily do second and third hop cascades. Um, you can in the decentralized, but it's very very tricky. So essentially, if if, if uh, you find somebody you test positive, you find their contacts, you find their contacts contact and their contacts contact. You walk the graph. Um, and, and so if you have the data, you know, for a few days, you can do that, which means you may be able to shut down the chains of infection further that out, if you like. Um, you can also, with the centralized data, potentially more quickly tune the, the, the Bluetooth proximity detection algorithm and also the self-diagnosis, you know, if there's an interface which lets people go through a menu of, of checks. Uh, you want to introduce the fact that taste and smell are now part of the official checklist for early signs of infection. You, know, you can change that more quickly, um, perhaps, although any app can be updated. The decentralized apps have this huge advantage that they, they do not have sight of the graph. Um, so that's sort of why it's harder to, to walk the graph. Um, they, you, you, you can't sort of export this graph um, to people. So the social graph risk we were talking about earlier are just removed. Um, and that removes the, the temptation, makes it very, very hard at least uh, to, to have sort of feature creep in the decentralized apps. And so that's a, a strong thing in their favor that they are sort of limited purpose, 
uh, by self-limiting um, a little bit. Uh, they're, they're, uh, they're kind of a, uh, they're a little bit myopic, if you like, but, but that, that, that they, they achieved the principal goal of, of contact tracing at one hop and, and possibly further. You have to be super clever about it. And I have had conversations with people in, in the DB3T architecture group, and, and, and you know, they convinced me they could. But, uh, you know, that's, that's, um, but that is in their favor and the, and, the, and the privacy side, the sort of government side, that, that, that makes things harder. Whereas the centralized system, uh, if, we, if we trust the agency with the database, if they expire it and they do a bunch of things which they currently don't do enough of, um, uh, then they have certain small advantages. Um, um, and it, again, until we quantify that, we don't know how big those advantages are, but they're second order by definition. So they're, you know, they're, they're not massive advantages, um, but, they're, but they, are, they are there. Epidemiologically, um, it's not clear that you need anything other than the data associated with an, in, an infected and susceptible person about whether the infection happens. So at what stage is the person who infected somebody else? It's important how infectious they are and then how susceptible the other person are. That it's, it's not clear that centralized and decentralized makes any difference to the ability to do that. So updating our understanding of the uh, what the, the vectors that are most effective and the overall parameters and then the, therefore for example, the success of interventions as well, simple things like the rate of contacts, you know, would be a, a number you can extract from either system. So there's no advantage in the centralized system with regard to the sort of general or specific epidemiology as far as I can see. So they're sure. kind of, yeah, okay. Um, so we've got a couple of minutes left before we move on to the Q&A, but if I could just finally um, come to Jonathan Evans. Um, so, so generally, um, so if you look at the supporters of a, of a decentralized model, this includes um, Google and Apple, who, uh, who have recently devised their own um, interface to allow the design of, of such decentralized systems. Um, what role do you think that tech giants uh, such as Google and Apple should have in influencing approaches to public health interventions, such as, as contact tracing for COVID? Is, is there a risk in, in handing over a a novel source of data to uh, the, the tech giants who generally operate with, with less oversight um, than a public body would? Well, I think there's a risk. The question is whether you can satisfactorily manage the risk, either you know, contractually or in other legal ways. Um, there's no doubt that the capabilities that some of the tech uh, firms bring, the tech giants bring, are in a class of their own in some areas. And you know, we don't want to deny uh, the health service, the ability to use those sorts of technology, but it needs to be done with awareness of the, the risks. It needs to be done with due accountability. We need to think carefully about impacts. My committee, the Committee on Standards in Public Life, issued a report on uh, AI and public standards earlier in the year, and we had a number of conversations with uh, health service and with, and with health practitioners, and there's no question that uh, technologies including DeepMind etc can contribute massively in this area but there are risks and sometimes uh, the government and some other parts of the public sector walk into some of these relationships without necessarily understanding the full nature of the risks either commercially or uh, ethically and uh, that's I think is where the problems arise. Sure. Okay, thank you very much, Jonathan. Um, I think we should probably move on to Q&A now because there's plenty of questions that have come in. Um, thank you all and, and also feel free to sort of submit as, as we go forward. Um, so firstly, uh, there's a question from uh, Victoria Young who says, um, what are your criteria for the discontinuation of contact tracing and what free choice would participants have in relation to their ongoing participation? Um, in the uh, in the event of a resurgent epidemic, um, R Rosaria, would would you would you mind taking that one? I'll try. Um, on the criteria, I think this is something that uh, scientists should uh, should ever say. In it certainly, uh, we want to make sure that the app uh, is um, uh, discontinued because uh, there are scientific reasons for doing uh, for doing so. Um, I think it's a decision that is um, that has to come from the policymakers on the basis of scientific um, uh, scientific advice, um, and it's something that uh, we might witness the uh, the opposite phenomenon. So it's, it's a low uptake or it's a slow uptake, and then it's also very hard for the public to 
uh, give it up because it pushes for a sense of security. But uh, hopefully that might be a debate that you know that might be a debate that takes us to that point, and, and we might be able to um, uh, have a coherent um, response uh, from the policy guidance. But the key point is that it's a decision that has to be scientifically supported. The same way is a decision that has to be scientifically supported when we decide to use this kind of apps. Sure. Thank you. Um, I've got another question that's directed at, um, at Lord Evans. So um, what is your opinion about the uh, European Commission's suggestion of cross-border tracking applications? Um, so about creating national tools that could communicate with each other across Europe um, when lots of people regularly cross borders. Um, what do you think the UK's position on, on this would be? Uh, you could answer that in a question in a number of ways. My guess is that the British government's response to that would be unfavourable, but that may or may not be for public health reasons, uh, given the, the European context. But, um, I, th I mean, first of all, it's surprising to find the EU proposing this, because obviously data protection issues loom extremely large in the thinking of particularly the European Parliament. So the fact of an, uh, an international tracking system it's, is kind of surprising, although I guess that the counterbalance to that is that the current closed borders uh, also breaches a very important principle for the EU, and therefore there's a kind of balance of, of, uh, of disadvantage that they're trying to, to, uh, to kind of reach the right point on. Um, if you're going to do this, you need some form of regulatory framework which is going to be acceptable to all the different countries, uh, which would tend within the European context to suggest a centralised regulatory framework. Again, I can't see the UK wanting to go down a path which uh, tied our system into a European regulatory framework, given the current political climate. So it makes a lot of sense if you're trying to reopen borders in Europe. Uh, and I think that, you know, there is a big political impetus for that within the EU. But I personally think it's rather unlikely that the British government in the current configuration would be keen to jump into some kind of international collaborative model of this sort, given that it would have to be centrally regulated in order to work at an international level. OK, thank you, Jonathan. Um, we've got another question in. Um, I'll, I'll pose this for Imam. Um, do you think that the tracking app or, or other surveillance practices could eventually become mandatory if there is a second, much deadlier wave of the pandemic? Um, I think people will start thinking about what multiple layers of risk management can be put in place to manage it. And again, it will come down to proportionality. Um, I mean, we heard a little bit earlier about this question of the importance of graphs. Graphs actually, have we found in many other places, are critical in detecting what you need to detect. I'll give you just an example in this context. Imagine if one edge off the graph was someone working in a healthcare home. That might make a very big difference, but you wouldn't see that in the distributed um, setup. So I think people are going to have to review this time and time again. When people say sunset, I'm thinking, do we mean hibernate? Um, because it, you know, it might come back and it may not even be this same instance, it may be others in the future. Um, I think the public is going to have to learn to be open minded. Um, it, it is what it is. I mean, uh, you know, we've been through this before with, a, with large major world wars and things like that. And people do adapt and they do learn. And eventually, you know, they understand the basics. There's a lot of education required in this. I think that's the key. Sure, fantastic. Thank you, uh, Imam. Um, if I could direct this next question to John Crowcroft. Um, so what is the critical number of users for digital contact tracing to work effectively in the UK? Um, and assuming that it's successful, what are the benchmarks that, that would be used for measuring its effectiveness? So this is a matter of uh, empirical study. Um, we don't know because the effective odds are, there's a feedback loop between the effective odds are and the number of people you need for contact tracing through an app to be effective. Um, so you can't just compute the probability that some pair of people meet and one's infectious and the other one's susceptible and that leads to an infection event and that the tracing app was being used by both people uh, and then average that over the whole country because the encounter rates between people are a power law distributed and the encounter, the, the durations of encounters are power law distributed, which means means don't tell you anything. So I can point people at papers they want to email me about this. We measured that. It was one of the things we were doing 15 years ago in measuring human contacts. And um, these numbers you hear banded about, it doesn't work unless it's 
firstly, that was if you only ever used an app. Um, and uh, that's not true because infections in households might not be detected by the app, but that's actually where most infections happen. You're, in, you're interested in the things that jump households or jump between uh, care homes or jump between you know, people in hospitals and wards and so on, So, um, which is where these things might work. But the fraction of people that have to run the app there is, is which people. Um, so these, this, the, the, there's no straight answer. Apologies for that. Um, it's much more important to see is it useful. If there's a second wave, by the way, uh, this is all off the, the, this just, you know, it's lockdown. <laughs> you have a big second wave, lockdown is your only tool. It's like the big hammer. And then you flip back, the contact tracing is when you're out of lockdown. <laughs> you know, there, there aren't any people moving around, you can't, there's no contact. So that's not, that's not the issue, right? So you have to look at what, where these tools sit in the, in the uh, applicability, uh, you know, um, uh, phases of these things. So, um, and you know, one of the goals of this is to avoid having a second wave. Unfortunately, for us, government officials have somewhat undermined the chances of that working, but um, that's a separate debate. Sure. Um, okay, then this will probably be our last question. Um, I'll direct this to Rosaria. Um, so, we've had a question on um, immunity certification and, and how it might work. Um, so, you know, if, if a, a person's entitlement is linked to some sort of biometric identifier, um, that, that brings in a, a further area of, of controversy and complication about the accuracy of identifiers and the legitimacy of them. Um, could, you, could you comment on, on that? Yes, indeed. Uh, I think these are two other questions that we couldn't uh, touch upon today because of time constraints, but it's uh, um, precision and security of these technologies, the robustness of these technologies, um, uh, as we speak. Uh, and we kind of give them like, um, we assume them, but actually uh, we know that, for example, COVID's app are uh, open to spoofing and these sorts of cyber attacks. We know that um, uh, face recognition or acquisition of biometrics is also problematic in this, uh, in this respect. Um, so it's true, I mean, like, uh, we have to make sure that the, let's say, technological infrastructures on which we are relying need to be robust uh, in terms of reliability and in terms of security. We also know that in cybersecurity, there is never a final word. So, the, you know, the moment you find a patch, there is another point uh, or another target that, that emerges. So this is a constant, uh, let's say, uh, dynamical uh, approach that needs to be uh, put in place. Uh, but sorry, sorry, Rosaria, um, we've just run out of time, um, no, but I'm thank sure. you very much for that. Sure. Um, so finally, we've got about a minute left. Um, I'll wrap it up. Um, but before, before I do, just um, a couple of thank yous. So firstly, to our wonderful panel for, for such an interesting and engaging discussion. Um, I know these conversations will continue. Um, secondly, I'd like to thank our fantastic events team at Turing for their support in setting this up, especially um, Joanna, Anika and Sophie. Um, and finally, a big thank you to everyone who took the time to listen today. Um, we have plenty more events coming up, which you can find on our website. If you just Google uh, the Alan Turing Institute and look at our events page, um, you should be able to find those. Um, so thanks again for joining us and um, we hope to see you again soon. All the best. <laughs>